Excellencies, colleagues and friends of the Initiative Against Arbitrary Detention in State-to-State -State Relations. Excellences, colleagues et amis de l'initiative Excellencies of the Initiative Against Arbitrary Detention in the uh, Relationships Between States for joining us today. My name is Julie Sunday. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Consular Security and Emergency Management at Global Affairs Canada. We are very pleased to welcome so many distinguished foreign ministers and your delegations as well as representatives from civil society. Your presence here speaks to our strong shared commitment to end the use of arbitrary detention for leverage in diplomatic relations. Votre présence ici témoigne... Your presence here uh, testifies of our work to eradicate arbitrary detention as um, a way to put uh, pressure in uh, diplomatic relations. Special guests here with us today, survivors, family members, and advocates of those who are or who have been arbitrarily detained. I would like to acknowledge our four co-hosts for this event. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Melanie Jolie. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship of Costa Rica, Arnaldo Andre. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malawi, Nancy Tembo. We look forward to welcoming our fourth co-host uh, shortly, the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. I would also like to thank Roger Carstens, the United States Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs, for being here today as well. Before we turn to our speakers, I would like to share a few logistical details with you. While this event is being held primarily in English, the live cast will include French translation. After the formal session, we will have a photo taken of our co-hosts and our speakers, and then a separate family photo of the representatives of each country present this evening. A gentle reminder that the reception portion of this event will be off the record. Now that we've covered our housekeeping issues, we can begin our formal program. I'd like to invite you to watch a pre-recorded welcome address from the Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau. Hello, every Hello everyone, bonjour à tous, and welcome to the high-level dialogue on the Arbitrary Detention Initiative. Le Canada a présenté sa déclaration en 2021, et depuis, 70 pays ont adhéré à cette initiative et convenu que la pratique de la détention arbitraire doit être éliminée. L'objectif d'aujourd'hui consiste à créer une dynamique et à parler d'une seule voix pour dire que les citoyens ne doivent jamais servir de pion dans les relations entre États. Arbitrary detention threatens individuals and strikes at the very heart of international law, the rules-based international order, peace and security. And two people at today's event, Michael Kovrig and Jason Rezaian, know its cruelty all too well. I want to be clear. There is no justification for arbitrary detention. And the stories of detainees, their families, and their supporters remind us that innocent lives are at stake. Pour eux, on doit mettre fin à cette pratique et mobiliser la solidarité mondiale autour de cet important dossier. En nous réunissant aujourd'hui, on montre au monde qu'on est fort, uni et qu'on fera tout ce qu'il faut afin de rendre cette pratique impensable pour les générations actuelles et futures. Merci de vous joindre au Canada et de vous montrer solidaire des victimes et de leurs familles. Thank you all.
I would now like to invite the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, the Honourable Melanie Jolie, to share her reflections on our progress to date uh, on this important initiative. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julie. Merci à tous. Ça me fait vraiment plaisir de. Uh, thank you to all. Uh, it is a pleasure to see you all today. Uh, I know that you all have a full schedule and uh, your being here testifies uh, to the importance uh, of the subject and your friendship to Canada. Um, uh, but the fact that you're here shows your solidarity towards the issue, but also towards uh, Canada's leadership and Costa Rica and also Malawi's leadership on this issue and of course the US. Um, it's an honor for me to be co-hosting uh, this with Arnaldo, with Nancy, and also Tony, who will be coming soon. And it's great to see Amal, seeing Vina as well, who's here, and of course, Michael and Jason. Thank you for being with us. Today, we're sending a strong message, a message that the world will not tolerate the abhorrent, unacceptable, and illegal practice of arbitrary detention for political leverage. We cannot allow people to be used as bargaining chips, and we must put an end to hostage diplomacy. This practice undermines the rules and the system that has kept us safe since the end of the Second World War, a system built on the rule of law, on universal human rights, and mutual respect between nations. This practice of arbitrary detention rips at the seams of friendship between countries, presenting a real threat to global security. And so in 2020, Canada put forward the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention in State-to-State -State Relations and invited the world to join a growing coalition of partners to do so. And let me be clear, and as mentioned by the Prime Minister, our citizens are not pawn in a geopolitical game. They are not proxies for disputes between states. Of course, I would like to thank Michael Kovrick, who's with us, and Jason Rosian, also with us, for being here and for your courage and advocacy on this very important matter. You will hear shortly from them about the personal cost of such inhuman practices, as well as their thoughts on how we can move to deter and respond to this egregious violation of human rights. The collective relief upon the release of Michael Kovrick and Michael Spaver, we call them in Canada our two Michaels, could be felt from coast to coast to coast in our country. Unfortunately, the story of the two Michaels is not unique. Many other people from around the world and their families are living similar nightmares wondering when they will see their loved ones again. I'm thinking of the ongoing detention of the Wall Street, journalist, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Garkovich, currently held by Russia. And my thoughts are with him and his loved ones. We have come a long way in the two and a half years since the declaration was launched. We have gone from 58 endorsers to 72, and as of today, this number is also growing. Last April, we welcomed Moldova, and I'm thrilled to announce today that Grenada has, is our newest endorsing country. So I know the PM, our PM said 70, we're at 74 at this point. <laughs> so the work doesn't end with this declaration, indeed. We're just getting started. One area for action is to anchor the principles of the declaration more solidly in an international legal framework. The goal is to provide states with clear and effective legal tools to respond to coercive diplomacy. I'm pleased to announce that to advance this work, we have struck an independent international panel composed of eminent jurists representing all regions of the world. The panel will deliver its recommendations on where the issue stands within the international system. And we hope the panel's work will lead towards concrete actions to curb and end this practice. 
And as of today, I'm very pleased to announce that Canadian Charles Jalau, the professor of uh, law at Florida International University and a highly respected member of the International Law Commission, will chair this panel. Bien entendu, on sait, il y a tellement plus à faire. On a... Bien sûr, il y a beaucoup à faire et uh, um, there's a lot to do. Et nous devons... This uh, arbitrary detention is in the increase. Our work is far from being over. To all our partners and allies in this work, I want to thank you for taking a stand against this practice with us mm -hmm. and also for encouraging other countries to join us. In some ways, we are folks in uncharted territory, and together we are defining the path ahead. If there's one thing that I want you to leave with tonight, it's the importance of global solidarity. And we saw it with our two Michaels. I know Michael, we, we call you our two Michaels. I therefore call on you here today as endorsers of the declarator, declaration, as supporters of this initiative, to share your ideas, to exchange information, and to take action when wherever it be, may be in private or public, because everything counts. Together, we can end arbitrary detention, and we can make the world safer for citizens. So together, we can end uh, the arbitrary detention, and we can ensure that our world is safer for all our citizens. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. At its heart, the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention and State-to-State -State Relations is about putting an end to flagrant and shocking violations of fundamental human rights. To share his perspective on this and other aspects of arbitrary detention, I would like to welcome to the podium the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship of the Republic of Costa Rica, His Excellency Arnaldo Andre. Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear friends, I'm very pleased to join on behalf of my country, Costa Rica, Minister Jolie of Canada, coming Secretary Blinken of the United States of America, and the Honorable Minister of Malawi, Tembo, as co-host of this event. We do so from a principled position. Arbitrary detention is unlawful in the line with international law, including international human rights law, no matter where it takes place. Everyone everywhere is entitled to the full realization of their human rights, in particular, the right of liberty and security. Costa Rica has witnessed in some parts of Latin America the impacts of such human rights violations during most of the 20th century, and we're observing with concern the erosion of democratic safeguards in different parts of the Western Hemisphere today. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in its Article 9 establishes the duty of states to take appropriate measures to protect the right of liberty of persons against deprivation by third parties, as well as against wrongful deprivation of liberty by the action of other states within their territory. The vigor of a democrat democracy relies in the impartiality of the justice system, the rule of law, the access to justice and effective remedies for the people. Arbitrary detentions not only contradict these principles, they reflect the strength of democracies. Costa Rica stands in full solidarity with all victims, survivors, and families of the crime of arbitrary detention. As an unarmed and peaceful nation that made international law its first line of defense, Costa Rica fully believes in the state's highest responsibility 
to protect its inhabitants from arbitrary arrest, detention, or even exile, as to raise its voice against all its forms. Costa Rica condemns in its strongest terms any punishment of persons for the legitimate exercise of their human rights, not the least the freedom of opinion or expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of belief, and the right to privacy. We're also aware that this violation of human rights is being used as a means to leverage political intentions. This is an affront to the friendly and peaceful relations that should prevail between states that has no end. We call upon all member states to, re to refrain from these harmful practices. No one should be deprived of the liberty for being who they are, especially when it comes to nationality, race, gender, or age. As we embarked on the 75th year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I issue a resounding call to governments and authorities around the world. Release, without hesitation, all those imprisoned for their unwavering commitment to their rights. We invite the United Nations system to focus their attention on this important issue, including through the mandate of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention with a human-centered approach that pursues justice for any victim of this crime. <clears throat> in today's world, and in the face of enormous challenges, we need to build trust and peace between our peoples, between states, and with our planet. You can count on Costa Rica to defend these principles. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So I would like to welcome to the podium in a moment Mr. Michael Kovrig, a Canadian citizen, policy analyst, former diplomat, and former detainee who was held in China for more than a thousand days. I had the privilege last June to present alongside Michael at the European Parliament Subcommittee on Human Rights, where for the first time he shared publicly his reflections about how the international community can prevent and respond to arbitrary detention. So I'm really pleased uh, we get to hear from you today. Thanks. Thank you very much. Arbitrary detention is the opposite of what the United Nations here stands for, the opposite of diplomacy. It's a cruel weapon of coercion in which the perpetrators hide behind a sham of legality. Why should you care? Most of you at this dialogue probably have diplomatic immunity, but you won't always. I was once a diplomat and worked at this very mission, and that didn't protect me. Imagine it, what if they came for you? What if security forces suddenly burst into this room, seized you, dragged you to the street, threw you in a car, drove you to a secret location, held you under relentless surveillance, interrogation, and pressure in a cell, forced, trying to force you to confess to invested, invented crimes, deprived you of adequate food, sunlight, sleep, or anything to occupy your mind? deprived you of your dignity, your rights, and your identity. You spend years confined, isolated, disempowered, your loved ones traumatized, wondering why did this happen? Why? Because a government wasn't competent, reasonable, or ethical enough to pursue its goals through diplomacy, and instead decided to use your suffering to blackmail your country. You should care because arbitrary detention creates small tears in the fabric of international law through which innocent people are dragged into darkness. It's part of a set of coercive behaviors that threaten to unravel the norms and the rules that keep us all secure, great states and small. We need to work together to stop it. Let me propose three areas of effort, drawing on my own analysis and a new Sufan Center report titled Citizens for Leverage. One of its authors, Vina Najibullah, 
is here with us today. Vina's experience with arbitrary detention includes leading a campaign that relentlessly and successfully fought for my own release. And that report lays out three principles. First, bring the detainees home. If your nationals are detained, your people are at risk, then build dedicated institutional capacity to support detainees, partner with their families, and resolve cases as swiftly as possible. Create an accountable government focal point with the policy framework, skills and authority to maximize leverage and minimize concessions while negotiating for detainees' release. Someone like Spiha Roger Karstens in the US, for example, it makes a critical difference. The guiding principle should be Blackstone's ratio. Better that 10 guilty persons walk free than one innocent suffer. But to preserve deterrence, which is crucial, offset any concessions with coordinated costs and consequences for the offenders. And that brings me to my second point, sharpening the tools of deterrence. Currently, the costs of arbitrary detention are asymmetric, low for perpetrators, high for targeted states, and astronomical for victims. To invert that equation, we must deny opportunities and punish violations. Build deterrence toolkits that include intelligence gathering, coordinated diplomacy, targeted sanctions, financial penalties, legal action, travel advisories and bans, and more. Create mechanisms to achieve justice for victims and accountability for perpetrators. Include measures to deter arbitrary detention in broader mechanisms for anti-coercion. And third, what we're doing here today, strengthen global norms. Promote the declaration against arbitrary detention to rally collective action, raise the cost of violations. Let's broaden support for the declaration and do more to implement its partnership action plan. Let's create a common repository of information on cases and a network of concerned actors to share good practices and coordinate responses, multilateral responses, because when we stand together, that is when we are stronger. Governments, civil society, and media should all work together to shape narratives and impose reputational costs by shaming detaining states. Collective action is the key to ending arbitrary detention. During my own thousand days in confinement, it meant the world to me to know that so many people and governments, many of them represented here, were working for my freedom. My family and I are deeply grateful. Without coordinated advocacy, pressure and negotiation, the sad reality is that I might still be sitting in that cell right now. Many other people, too many, are still trapped in similar political nightmares. Let's work together to free them. Let's work together to make sure that no one has to suffer arbitrary detention. And let's work together to strengthen the international norms that keep us all secure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Arbitrary detention does not respect geographic boundaries, is a practice that clearly undermines friendly relations among states. We're stronger when we act in solidarity to oppose it, and so we are pleased that countries from all regions of the world have been endorsing the declaration and condemning this practice. It is now my pleasure to welcome the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Malawi, Her Excellency Nancy Tembo. Excellencies, distinguished guests, allow me to begin my expressing my heartfelt gratitude to you, Honorable Minister Melanie Jolie, and to the Government of Canada for your invaluable efforts in championing the cause against arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations. 
your leadership and our unwavering support serve as a beacon of inspiration for nations worldwide, and your dedication is commendable. Malawi endorsed the initiative against arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations in 2021, marking a significant milestone in our commitment to upholding the principles of human rights, the independence of the judiciary, and the rule of law. These principles are not mere rhetoric uh, on parchment. They are enshrined in the very soul of our constitution, reflecting the core values that we hold dear as a nation, values that underscore our commitment to justice, equality, and freedom. Malawi embraced this noble cause because we firmly believe in rule of law as the cornerstone of state-to-state -state relations. The use of arbitrary detention as a coercive tool not only contradicts this essential principle, but also undermines our unwavering dedication to achieving peaceful negotiated settlement to disputes. We stand at a, as a testament to the fact that diplomacy and open communication are far more effective tools for resolving differences than unjust incarceration of individuals. Our presence at this gathering is an affirmation of our unwavering commitment and resolute to support this declaration and its bedrock principles. We stand shoulder to shoulder with all nations in the unrelenting pursuit of justice, the protection of human rights, the defense of individual freedoms. Together we form an alliance to combat the challenge of arbitrary detention. Looking ahead, it is imperative that we strengthen our institutions, particularly legal departments within our ministers of foreign affairs and justice, our judiciary, and our investigative arms of governments. By forging stronger bonds within these pillars, we can foster greater information sharing, exchange invaluable, invaluable best practices, conduct vital research, and most importantly, enhance international collaboration in our shared quest to end arbitrary detention. Accountability is a foundation, is a foundation upon which trust and justice are built, holding nations responsible for upholding their commitments and adhering to international standards. Furthermore, it is the safeguard against injustices, a vital mechanism of redress and a powerful deterrent against the recurrence of harmful practices. Our commitment to accountability will reinforce our collective resolve to protect the rights and dignity of individuals across the globe, ensuring that no one is above the law and that fairness prevails in our shared journey toward a brighter, more just future. In this collective effort, we can forge a path toward a world where the principles of human rights, justice, and peaceful dialogue prevail as the norm where the dark shadow of arbitrary detention becomes a relic of a bagon illa. Together we can rewrite the narrative of our world, replacing... <laughs> it is clear to me that the problem in our human rights system is that criminals are not punished for their crimes. When the Russian government detains an American journalist without any legal basis, what happens? They stop critical reporting by that journalist. Then many other journalists put their pens down. They face no legal consequence, and then in all likelihood, they get the benefits of a prisoner swap. As Michael alluded to, autocrats use lawfare to arbitrarily detain because fancy courtrooms and robed judges can give a veneer of legitimacy to hostage taking. 
And if they are not challenged, they will continue to reap the benefits of these <coughs> heinous acts. That's why I supported the launch of this initiative two years ago. And since then, things have only become more urgent. Autocratic states now outnumber the number of liberal democracies. And the detention of foreign journalists in particular has become a favorite tool in an autocrat's kit. Ask the lawyers for Evan Gerskovich, who are here. Ask Peter Greste, who I see here. And of course, Jason Rezaian, who you will hear from in a moment. Ask my client, Filipino-American Nobel laureate and journalist Maria Ressa, who faces the rest of her life behind bars if Philippine courts affirm her conviction for libel and other bogus charges. In the war against truth, arbitrary detention is a powerful weapon. So this is not a time for democracies to bury their heads in the sand or pat themselves on the back for being better than the worst of us. Democracies must be more vocal, more determined, and more united. And they should champion international law as the response to international crimes. In my work defending victims of arbitrary detention, I see effective responses grounded in international law, used in some cases, some of the time. I hope this initiative can help to turn such sporadic measures into a system. Here are some ideas for how this can be done. First, governments should ensure that officials who are responsible for arbitrary detention are systematically subjected to targeted sanctions. In some of the cases that I've worked on, the mere threat of sanctions can be sufficient for a government to change course. In others, prosecutors, judges, sometimes officials are subjected to travel bans and asset freezes. But until these kinds of responses become the norm and instead of the exception, they're not going to serve as a deterrent. Second, trading systems like the European Union's GSP Plus system that make financial rewards conditional on compliance with international law should be adopted by more states around the world. Third, governments should provide emergency visas to individuals targeted by authoritarian states. Getting a target out of the country in time is sometimes the only way to keep them safe from arbitrary detention or even death. So I commend the Canadian government uh, for agreeing to bring uh, 500 journalists and advocates to, Can to Canada to safety this year. And I hope others will follow suit. Fourth, governments should provide robust consular assistance to their nationals detained abroad. That means giving them legal support, um, prison visits, and monitoring their trials. Many detainees lack basic legal advice, or even a record of what happens at their trial, states should guarantee that they will fill the gap. Fifth, don't worry, I only have six. The fifth is that governments should sign up to international bodies that hold states to account when they violate international laws, including those on arbitrary detention. That means states should recognize the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to adjudicate violations of international treaties. They should create a task force to investigate abuses, and they should bolster the capacity of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, including by allowing it to um, have public hearings. Finally, governments should boost prosecutions for crimes against humanity. These are crimes that can be committed through the systematic deprivation of liberty. This can be done by signing up to the statute of the International Criminal Court for those states that haven't already done so, and by signing up to an upcoming treaty on crimes against humanity that will make it possible to prosecute that crime in national courts. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many families here whose lives were torn apart when a repressive government used one of them as a political pawn. I hope that this initiative will help to make such abuses history and that in the meantime, it can help to ensure that violators are held to account. Thank you. Thank you. 
At the core of the Arbitrary Detention Initiative are the testimonies, strength, and resilience of survivors, their families, and their advocates. The initiative also honors the memories of those who did not survive and the voices of their loved ones. We have already had the benefit of hearing from Michael Kovrig. I would like to acknowledge some other special guests who are here with us today. Peter Grest, an Australian journalist who was imprisoned in Egypt for over a year. Vina Najabula, a tireless advocate for Michael Kovrig and whose paper on arbitrary detention was recently published by the Sufan Center. David Levinson, whose father, Robert Levinson, was detained in Iran in 2007 and who has never come home. Elizabeth Whelan, sister of Paul Whelan, who is currently detained in Russia. Nitsar Zaka, founder of Hostage Aid Worldwide, who was detained in Iran for almost four years. And last but not least, Jason Rezaian, who was working as an international correspondent when he was detained in Iran for 544 days. Jason, thank you for being here, and I'd like to invite you to the podium. Thank you for that introduction, Julie. Uh, thank you to our hosts for organizing this important event. Uh, to all of the ministers and deputies who are here today, uh, to Michael and Amal uh, for their powerful words, to my friends from the hostage community, uh, the hostage recovery community, to my dear friend Diane Foley. Um, it's a really wonderful thing to be able to, to have this conversation. And it wasn't that long ago that there was no forum for a conversation like this one and certainly not at this level. So I want to take a, a moment to acknowledge that. And, um, you know, I, I think for those of us who've been working in this space for a long time, it's a very heartening thing to see so many governments coming together to talk about this devastating issue. And I really want to applaud Canada's foreign ministry for elevating this issue to one that some of us have come to understand as a threat to the global order and to the very notion of what, what it means to be a citizen, especially of a democracy. I talk about the phenomenon of wrongful detention a lot, and it's usually in the US context. I tell people that this cannot continue to be seen as a partisan issue. It's not one. Taken more broadly, this is not the of Iran's law enforcement. It's intelligence services, judiciary, penal system, parliament, executive branch, foreign affairs, national security divisions, and state media all conspires, conspired to manufacture out of me some sort of super villain. I'm the main character of a 30 episode nighttime television series that had the highest production cost in the broadcaster's history. I laugh about that now. Uh, the producer of that show happens to be in New York right now as part of President Raisi's delegation. I put his name forward uh, among a, a tranche of uh, submissions for global Magnitsky sanctions. He's here right now. He should be in jail or not allowed to come to this country. Um, I've received countless death threats because of that television show. I, I continue to get death threats, uh, but you know we deal with it. All of that because I had the audacity as an American citizen to go to work as a journalist in another country with full state permission, as my colleague Evan Grishkovich did in Russia. These detentions are by design highly personalized, intended to send clear messages, and oftentimes make less clear demands. And for my friend Roger Karstens, the Spiha, you know, part of his job is figuring out what those demands are, but the message being sent is a chilling one, as we've already alluded to tonight. And we're gonna have to respond with a similar sort of purpose and clarity. And to get there, we have to be very honest with ourselves. We have not until now taken this crisis seriously. 
and none of our countries will be able to solve it alone. I want to give you two very clear pieces of advice as you focus your attention on addressing this challenge that frankly has plagued humanity for centuries. First, the question of whether or not to engage in negotiation with the captors of our citizens is a irrelevant one. And ultimately, it's, it's very counterproductive. This debate is an endless loop that's gone on for decades, and it's slowed progress in cases. The better question is, what are we doing to decrease this behavior and make it costlier? That's where we need to focus our attention and resources. Not negotiating means leaving people behind for years, and in some cases, forever. That's completely unacceptable. Working to free currently wrongfully detained citizens while at the same time cultivating effective and credible deterrence that can be shared and implemented in tandem with other governments, those are your two goals. They are in no way at, at, at odds with each other. They're interconnected and they're equally urgent. Finally, justice for victims and accountability for perpetrators. For far too long, we've largely ignored this part of the story. A commitment to both ensures a kind of continuity towards a solution that has never existed before and is the appropriate response to what can only be described as a serialized crime that is being undertaken by a growing number of states. Thank you very much. Thank you. Finally, I would like to welcome the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to the podium for closing remarks. Thank you all very much. Um, I have to say it's a little bit humbling to speak uh, after Jason, who has been an extraordinary profile in courage, uh, an extraordinary profile in absolute determination to move all of us to a better place on this issue that um, in so many ways uh, is, uh, for me, one of the most profound things that um, I have to deal with in my job, and I suspect uh, Melanie and my other colleagues feel the same way. There are a lot of terrible things happening day, out, day in, day out around the world. But there's something so profoundly callous and inhumane about this practice of ripping people from their lives, from their families, from their loved ones, to use them as political pawns. And I don't know, just on a human level, sometimes I look across the table at a counterpart whose country is engaged in this and really ask myself how, um, how they sleep at night. But we have a profound reality to deal with, and uh, I take great inspiration from what we just heard from Jason. I'm really grateful to you. I'm grateful to Michael Kovarik, the, the two Michaels, in fact, for advocating on behalf of those who are being arbitrarily detained, standing up to governments engaged in these abuses. To the loved ones of those who have been or are still held hostage or wrongfully detained, including the Wheel and Foley and Levinson families, who I believe are here with us today, your own resilience, your own extraordinarily tenacious advocacy, the love that drives it is also incredibly humbling to those of us who are serving in positions of responsibility and trying to make good on this particular responsibility. It's inspirational. And I know uh, sometimes we're on the receiving end of your advocacy, uh, your encouragement, and more than encouragement, it's so vital, it's so necessary. Uh, and it's so deeply appreciated, even if it sometimes doesn't seem like we appreciate it. To my friend, Melanie Jolie, thank you, not just for hosting us, but thank you for your leadership over virtually from day one since we've been working together in combating arbitrary detention. Um, here in a room that, as I understand it, is named for Ken Taylor, 
who didn't hesitate to shelter those six Americans in Tehran in 1979, we are reminded that Canada's commitment to this issue goes back for decades. And I want to thank our co-hosts as well, Foreign Minister Andre and Foreign Minister Tembo, for their commitment, for their determination on this. Uh, I just have to acknowledge quickly uh, a couple of other people, one who is here, one who is not. The one who is here is my friend and colleague, Roger Carsons, who every single day is the beating heart of our administration's efforts to bring home Americans who are wrongfully detained. Roger makes a card for me that I carry in my pocket every day. It has a list of those Americans who are being wrongfully detained somewhere around the world. I get no greater satisfaction in this job than the days when we get to cross someone off that list, as we were able to do just this week. But that doesn't just happen. It really is the product of extraordinary work, extraordinary engagement, starting with Roger, starting with a remarkable team of uh, individuals that he's built around him, who I think demonstrate every day both their tenacity and their profound humanity. And I'm grateful, Roger, to you. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge someone who's not with us today, and that is a dear friend that we, we lost earlier this month, Bill Richardson. Um, I've known Bill for decades. Um, he was uh, someone that uh, inspired me when I first started in government service during the Clinton administration. You all know he had a remarkably storied career as a member of Congress, governor, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, appropriately, secretary of energy. But I think the New York Times headline remembered him simply as champion of Americans held overseas. And I suspect that Bill would be incredibly gratified by that headline summary of what was truly a remarkable career. He was doing this work right up until the very end, and I know how much he meant to so many people in this room. And I imagine he would have been happy to know that we welcomed home this week Simak Namazi, Murad Tabaz, Ahmad Shargi, two other Americans from their unjust detention in Iran. And I want to express my own gratitude to our partners overseas who helped make this happen, uh, to our colleagues in Oman, uh, in Qatar, in Switzerland, in the United Kingdom. We're also keenly aware that dozens of U.S. nationals are still wrongfully detained, still suffering, as are their families and loved ones. These are our fellow citizens, Americans living and working abroad, business people, journalists, travelers, held without cause, without due process, merely to become a human bargaining chip, which is why we will not stop our work to free every single one of them. In this job, I have no higher priority than the security of my fellow Americans abroad. It's why the United States government has worked relentlessly to free Americans who've been unjustly detained. And I am very proud of the fact that during this administration, we have brought home 35 people over the past two and a half years from countries, alas, around the world. But as this group appreciates especially, and as Jason said so eloquently and powerfully, we also have a profound responsibility to do everything possible to deter, to deter future instances of arbitrary detention. Uh, last July, President Biden signed an executive order to try to expand our tools and disrupt these practices, building off the experience of prior administrations and, critically, the 2020 Robert Levinson Act. This includes authorizing new financial and travel restrictions like the ones we imposed just this week on the Iranian Ministry of Intelligence and Security and former President Ahmadinejad. The most effective way, though, to make these regimes think twice is by acting together, amplifying the cost of arbitrary detention in ways that no country can achieve if it's acting simply on its own. That would make all of our citizens safer. That's the spirit behind the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention, which the United States endorsed during President Biden's first month in office, with Canada leading the charge. 73 nations have now committed to this initiative, plus several more who joined it today. At this first ministerial, since the declaration launched, we have a chance to continue this momentum, and I hope really to build on it. Um, we can share best practices by enhancing our own country's efforts to free those arbitrarily detained. 
we can align uh, on what constitutes arbitrary detention and do that for greater diplomatic leverage so that it's clear what merits a response from the international community. We can grow this coalition to include more countries from every region. More importantly, we can send a message. We can send a message that our people are not pawns and that if a country holds any of our citizens, all of us will hold them accountable, whether that's sanctioning perpetrators and their families, freezing their assets, or forbidding entry into any one of our countries. Now, the bottom line is not many people want to travel somewhere where they could be imprisoned on a whim. Not a lot of companies want to do business in a place like that, which means that countries engaging in arbitrary detention will succeed only in further isolating themselves, in becoming pariahs. By working together, we can maintain and strengthen global pressure and continue to reinforce norms against these practices and keep our people safe. These norms are important. And I know that oftentimes when we come to a place like New York for the UN General Assembly, and you got all these diplomats sitting around rooms and talking about norms and standards, it can seem kind of meaningless in the real world that we are also living in. But I have to tell you that over time, the more countries you can get behind a norm, a rule, a standard, a basic understanding, the more powerful it becomes, the more effective it becomes, the more aberrational the practices of countries that ignore these norms. So there's real value in this work. Nations like Iran and Russia may see our care for each other as a weakness to be exploited. But we know that our common humanity is actually, actually our most powerful source of enduring strength. And as we further our cooperation to counter arbitrary detention, we take inspiration from the humanity of those behind prison walls and the humanity of anyone agitating for their freedom. Canadians marching 7,000 steps in honor of Michael Kovrig's daily walk around his cell. Ali Rezaian, traveling 200 nights in a year, pleading his brother's case to anyone who would lend an ear. Evan Griskovich, still teasing his mom about the terrible food and left to Fort prison uh, and how it reminds him of her cooking. <laughs> we, we owe it to our people to do everything in our power, not only to bring them home, but to make sure that no one else lives their nightmares by standing together, by amplifying this issue. We're one step closer, one step closer to that future. So I thank you all profoundly for your willingness to work together on this. We together can make a big difference. Thank you very much. Excellencies, colleagues, and friends, thank you once again for being with us today to bring international attention to this issue. Avec votre aide, nous continuerons. So with your help, uh, we will defend uh, all those who were victims of this of, um, abhorrent uh, practice, and we will employ our power of dissuasion to end arbitrary detention. We're taking two group photos. The first photo will include the co-hosts and speakers. And so if I could ask you to follow me into the foyer in just a moment. Um, I'd be really grateful if the remaining guests could just stay for a few moments in here, um, and my colleague will take the floor, but the second photo will be all foreign ministers or your representatives. Thank you. Okay. 